To welcome everyone to our second day of the conference, we will hear and discuss two presentations in this first section, which I will moderate. Around uh, half past 11, we look forward to a half hour coffee break and mm -hmm. I'll come to the introduction of our first speaker. Sarah albies Wieck is a professor of modern and contemporary history with special emphasis on non-European history at the University of Münster. She habilitated at the University of Cologne with a thesis on taxing difference, fiscal petitions, negotiating social differences and belonging in Peru and New Spain, 16th to 19th century. Mrs. Albias Wieck received her doctorate at Ethnology with special emphasis on ancient American studies from the University of Bonn, with a study on external contacts of, yes, how I spell it, Tarascan Taras, mm -hmm. state, influences from within and outside Mesoamerica. She will give a lecture on the topic of Calidad, Evolution and Negotiation of Social Difference in Colonial Spanish America and the Philippines. This is obvious week. We, have, we are happy to have you here. Um, I give you the floor. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction and for the invitation to the three organizers. Yes, I'm uh, actually in the process of changing the name of my professorship in Münster, which is terribly uh, Eurocentric. Um, and uh, it's hopefully soon <laughs> going to be denominated only Latin America, um, well, with all the uh, terrible German special emphasis uh, things still remaining, but <laughs> I think this is something we have to simply uh, live with. Um, I will speak today um, about research I conduct conducted for many years about fiscal categorizations, which um, form part of my um, habilitation thesis, which was published um, at the end of 2022 um, by Brill uh, with the title Taxing Difference. And I will focus today mainly on the concept of calidad and its entanglement with fiscal categorization, hoping to add something to the discussion of momentum of its own. Um, I found it quite difficult to apply this concept to my research, but maybe some of the con connections are clearer for you um, than for me, and we can discuss this later. Um, I'm going to focus mainly on the, on the first of the three structural animal elements in a state-based hierarchical order of, of societies with group orientation, which is very clearly pre uh, present. Um, you may see some glimpses about the other two, um, which I think are only partially um, present um, in my case. And I mostly struggle with the overall term of the self-propelled dynamics, because from the point of view of the pre-Spanish societies um, in America, the Spanish colonialism is a huge external influence. And um, this is <laughs> why I find it a little bit difficult. I like the idea of finding like structural common elements of, if you want to call them like that, um, pre-modern societies. Um, and I also like the idea of not only look at the entanglements, but to, yeah, we discussed it a little bit uh, over dinner uh, later uh, last night, and maybe we can discuss it um, again after my talk. Um, for those of you who are not so common, well, now it's not working again, so next, next slide, please. <laughs> it's on. No, yeah, this one. Um, to, um, to show you the Spanish Empire here together during the personal union with uh, Portugal, with the Portuguese um, di um, domains, my um, regional focus uh, for, the, um, for the book was um, Michoacán in uh, New Spain, in the west of New Spain, and um, Cajamarca in northern Peru, um, which are the... Uh, these two circles, well, very broadly, <laughs> and... Um, as like a byproduct of this research, um, I did some comparison with the Philippines, which I will also mention briefly, but the like a systematical comparison was only um, among Cajamarca and um, Michoacan. 
First, I want to uh, start with a few words about the social organization in pre-Hispanic times. In imperial pre-Hispanic societies, such as the Inca, Mexica, or Tarascan Empire, um, peoples were organized in corporate units of descent. In the Inca Empire, the term Ayu is important. The terms Pachaca and Guaranga were units in the decimal organization of the Inca Empire, with the Pachaca ideally comprising 100 and the Guaranga uh, 1,000 people. However, these numbers were often not uh, respected, and in Cajamarca, the term Ayu and Pachaca are often used interchangeably in the sources, which of course also ha can have to do with the Spanish influence, uh, which dot did not really understand um, differences uh, between both terms. Um, the equivalent uh, in the Mexica, otherwise known as Aztec Empire, was the Calpuli. And in the Tarascan Empire, which roughly comprised this area of the um, modern state of Michoacan, the terms Cuarta house and uh, house and Siroqua um, lineage were, um, were relevant. Contrary to the terms Ayu and Pachaca and Guaranga in Peru, which lasted uh, until the 19th century and in other parts of the Andes, Ayu um, uh, partly until today, in Michoacan, the terms Cuarta and Siroqua disappeared from the sources already during the 16th um, century. What is important um, to mention in the context of my research, research is the different degree of categorization of migrants in the pre-Hispanic empires. Um, Mit Makuna and Yanakona in the Inca Empire um, were important categorizations, mostly uh, Mit Makuna, Hispanicized later as uh, Mitimais, where people resettled um, by the Inca Empire, um, which uh, however, still form part of their original Ayus, and Yanakona was, were a kind of specialized servants, which often uh, migrated, but not necessarily. Um, but in the Tarascan Empire, I could not find, which until a certain point uh, can be um, due to the so availability of sources, but I did not find any similar um, categorization of um, migrants. Um, neither did I in the Philippines, but there I studied it less, so <laughs> there might be something I simply am not aware about. Uh, in the uh, Tarascan Empire, different language groups um, lived together. Um, however, in my opinion, there's uh, not a very strong basis to denom den denominate them as ethnic groups. I would not um, sort it out altogether, but I think ethnicity was not a, an important um, social organizer. And I'm rather fond of the proposal made by Rosenev and Monson, which have, uh, who have proposed that the society in the Tarascan Empire was organized in three units. The Quarta household, as I quote, a basic unit of usufruct con control in accordance with Hangequa, organized in recognizable kinship, and within a Siroqua lineage, um, end of quote. Castro Gutierrez has proposed that nothing analogous to the Aztec Calpuli existed in Michoacan because their organization was more similar to the Aztec noble house or Tecali. This seems to be analogous to the use of the term Quarta as proposed by Monson, who interestingly states that the term Quarta was also used for Spaniards. Interestingly, the pictogram for the Aztec social unit or Mexica social unit of the Calpuli contained the logogram for house, which you can um, see here. Um, as you can also see in the um, Codex um, Boturini for the different um, Calpultin, um, and also in the um, Michtec uh, Sapotec uh, area where pre-Spanic as well as colonial codices show the meaning of house as the origin of a lineage. Um, this is uh, from the 17th century genealogy, genealogy of the Lords of Etla in Oaxaca. Mm -hmm. However, as I already said, the Tarascan terminology, terminology in Michoacan for house and lineage is practically invisible in the sources that are sub subsequent to the mid-16th century. Probably this was due to the very early process of congregations in Michoacan, which might have disrupted this form of organization. Um, instead, the belonging to a certain town became par paramount, and the nobles lost the right to grant access, access to, land, to lands. Now I would uh, like to turn to Spain on the eve uh, of the conquest. Uh, a central uh, concept for my research was the concept of the limpieza o pureza de sangre, or purity of blood. The Reconquista, the re reconquest of Spain from the Moors, led to the expulsion of forced conversion of the remaining Jews and Moors. As early as 1449, a statute was passed in Toledo against these converted um, so-called new Christians, um, the conversos. The purity of blood was about uh, proving that one was not descended from non-Christians, that is, one was an old Christian. 
And in Hispanic America, at least in the great empires of the Inca, Mexica and Tarasca, uh, when this idea of purity of blood came to um, America, um, which uh, was forbidden, um, by the way, for all conversos in, in theory, in practice it happened, but in, in, in theory they could not um, travel to the overseas um, domain. And so the this idea about um, ancestry, which already existed in pre-Hispanic America, merged with these ideas of um, purity of blood, which also had to do um, with ancestry. Of course, they were different, but they had um, some common elements, which is the focus on uh, on the importance of, of ancestry. Um, in America, the um, intense reference to, to religion um, changed a little bit because as neophytos, as newcomers to the faith, indigenous peoples were precisely not equated with Jews or Moors, um, so that they were in principle capable of purity, as shown by some petitions of indigenous nobles who presented themselves as pure indigenous people, as indios puros. Um, here you can see um, a little excerpt um, from a petition from the uh, 18th century. Instead, um, purity of blood um, now um, began to refer um, more to what was called calidad, which I will define a little bit more in a moment. American petitions on purity of blood are then um, only very marginally uh, about the descent of heretics um, or Jews and Moors. Instead, especially in the 18th century, um, it is about the descent of um, African enslaved people, uh, which, uh, which is denominated, den denominated in the sources at bad race as mala raza. The social um, stigma um, here is also um, theological, uh, because Africans were seen as the descendants of, um, descendants of Noah son Ham. Uh, son Ham. According to this myth, Ham had sinned against his father Noah and his descendants had to atone for the sin of their forefather with their dark skin color and eternal servitude, which was often used also as a legitimator um, for slavery. And uh, in other words, we can see a slow change from uh, a more uh, religiously oriented purity, which had already some element of body with blood and mother's milk, to uh, what I would call a more racialized purity in Hispanic America, but, but this did not happen immediately. It was a long process and it became much clearer in the 18th century and not um, immediately um, in, the, in the 16th. And I think this process uh, is important. Now, now I come to the term um, calidad. The literal translation, which would be uh, quality, um, does not make uh, much sense. This is why I use uh, the um, Spanish term. And similar terms in the sources were uh, naturaleza and fuero. Um, instead of calidad, a considerable part of the um, historiography for colonial America speaks of ethnicity or of um, raci racialization. Um, but even um, if there are some similarities with, which um, undeniably exist, I would not equate them. I think it's not entirely the same. Um, calidad um, means the categorization of people based on a complex interplay of ancestry, as a public reputation, um, purity or impurity, religion, and legal and fiscal status. And uh, these categorizations shifted uh, among uh, across time and space, and they carried with them specific obligations and privileges, being tribute and forced labor the most significant significant ones. If one was attributed the calidad of being, being Indio, this person could at least potentially be um, obliged to pay tribute and do forced labor service. Uh, a general note on the organization of difference in this time, this is not something um, specific um, for um, Spanish America, but the Spanish Empire, like other empires of the time, governed diverse groups, modifying um, and organizing the difference um, between them. The equality of all vessels was uh, definitely not the aim of m early modern empires, which differentiated them from uh, modern nation states. How empires modified this difference is, in my point of view, um, especially visible in the fiscal system, or more precisely, in the fiscal categorizations. These categorizations overlap with other social categorizations, uh, such as religion, prof profession, status, and gender. And the fiscal system helps analyzing social differences because it had very concrete effects on the lives of all members 
of an empire on their money and on their labor, for, labor force. Fiscal systems were uh, on the one hand ordered um, from above by law, but uh, vessels also contested their categorization and sometimes tried uh, to change it. And this process of negotiation is visible in um, petitions and petitions which have been called um, by other scholars Peticiones de Cambio de Fuero or Provanza de Calidad. Mm -hmm. And I will show you some examples later because these are, besides the leg legislation, which is obviously important, um, the main sources um, I worked with. Um, there exists, uh, existed some possibilities of changing categorizations, which sometimes were also favored by similar, similar labor and living conditions. And my research has shown that it were mostly people on the margins who changed categorizations, especially migrants or descendants of migrants and people with mixed ancestry, mixed, not um, understood in a, in a racial se or racialized sense, but more uh, of parents belonging to different categor categorizations. Mm -hmm. And uh, some changes were more frequent than others. It is important to mention that most people stayed in one category um, during their entire life and that not everybody uh, could easily change uh, categorizations and there were limits of changing. Mm -hmm. So when we analyze, analyze these petitions, of course, we see always the conflict and where people change and the, the people which did not change, they are not so visible in this type of sources, but we can see them in other sources such, such as, for example, in, in the lists of um, inspections, which are called um, visitas, which I also um, took into account. Um, before um, proceeding uh, to show you some examples from the sources, I would like to, to show you the complete set of the um, fiscal categorizations in the three regions I studied. Um, the ca categorizations you can see here are ordered um, according to the social hierarchy of the time from left to right. And um, it, has, it is important to clarify that the categorizations I show here were valid mostly for the 18th century and uh, um, in the Philippines for the central island of Luzon, for New Spain in Michoacán, and for Peru in Cajamarca. Because in other regions and periods, some of these uh, categorizations um, were different uh, or they varied uh, in meaning. Mm -hmm. All categories uh, within uh, the red uh, box um, had to pay a tribute, which was um, a poll, ta poll tax. Also, it was um, sometimes um, also collected um, collectively and also um, set collectively. Um, as you uh, might see, the, um, the, diff uh, the categorizations within the red frame um, are very different from one region to, it, uh, to, to another, while the, um, the categorizations outside the frame are very similar um, throughout uh, the Spanish uh, empire. Um, there are some, um, some of these categorizations which are written like on the margins of the box. This had to do that it, um, often, they often had a theoretical and legal obligation to pay tribute, but they did not pay it in, 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 um, in practice. This is always very important uh, in Spanish America to differentiate between the um, theoretical legal obligations and the practice of what really actually um, happened. Um, uh, I think uh, I, would, I won't go into detail of all the categorizations because it would take too long, but I would uh, like to point out um, uh, a few um, general differences. One is the um, practice of taxation of Afro-descendants, um, which uh, by law had to pay since the late 16th century, but uh, this um, obligation was only um, really enforced in New Spain and more towards um, in, in the second uh, half of the colonial um, period, um, and uh, a central difference between central difference between the Philippines and Spanish America was what that in, that in the Philippines the Chinese migrants and their descendants, which were called Sangleyes, or mm -hmm. in their mixtures, mixtures um, mestizos de sangre, um, were important because they were demog demographically, socially, and economically important. There were some. Um, Asian migrants in Spanish America too, but they never constituted a different fiscal categorization there. In the Philippines, um, they did. 
and um, further differences um, can be explained by the categorizations of migrants and their descendants and the survival and adaptation of pre-Hispanic categorizations, which are clearer in Peru uh, than in um, New Spain. Um, then um, a little bit about uh, the sources. Um, there were several uh, possibilities to change categorization. Uh, one is migration, um, which is very important, but we can also see it in petitions. Another one is camouflage. This is very much harder to find in the sources. And uh, I have some very isolated cases, but uh, not enough to do a systematical study. Um, but what I could study um, systematically were the um, petitions. Um, they have been called by Ot Argus, Peticiones de Cambio de Fuero, and by Norma Angelica Castillo Palma, Provanzas de Calidad. But these are not terms from the sources. If you go to the archives, you won't find a li label in the archive where all these petitions are grouped together. You have to find, you have to look for them in different parts of the archives, but you can identify them, I think, quite easily because they have um, a common structure um, and a common topic, uh, which the aim is always to change or defend one's categorization one's fiscal categorization. Um, often as a cause, um, it is alleged that they were wrongly registered in the last uh, count or in the last registration of, um, of people. Um, there are on the one hand individual petitions, but also petitions um, by groups. Um, they are mostly from the um, tribute payers or the people who are, say, say they are not tribute payers themselves, but sometimes there are also petitions by the middle level um, of the colo mid, uh, middle level of the colonial um, administration. And um, there's like a standard, a standard set of proofs these petitioners presented, which were not uh, always completely present, but only um, part of them. And um, these are, these proofs are um, extracts from parish and census records tribute receipts and witness statements. And uh, these proofs um, referred to the dissent, the public reputation, and the official categorization of the people in question. Um, now some quantitative remarks um, for the petitions I systematically analyzed um, for my book. They were all from Cajamarca in Peru and Michoacan in New Spain. Um, the Philippines are not included here in this table. Um, and as you can see, there were very few petitions from the 16th century. Um, this has, on the one hand, to do with the reasons of archival preservation, mm -hmm. and on the other hand, uh, with the fact that the fiscal system was not yet very clearly um, established. And uh, these early petitions are mostly by indigenous nobles who claim that they um, are nobles and that therefore they should be exempted from tribute, tribute and labor service. And most petitions are from the 18th century, which has to do with the Bourbon reforms, which tried to raise a revenue um, from tribute. The existence of post-colonial um, petitions in Peru um, is explained by the fact that there are very clear um, col uh, co continuations with the colonial tribute um, until the 1850s in Ecuador and Bolivia. It goes even further until the 1870s. Um, this did not happen in, in Mexico after independence. This is why we don't have these kind of um, petitions there. Um, the examples I will present you in a moment are all from the 17th century because I was asked here to speak more about 16th and 17th uh, century. I uh, did a lot of these tables with uh, comparisons with changes. They are um, listed here in this uh, in this row, the self-inscriptions of the petitioners and here, uh, above the um, external inscriptions, uh, which with other people assigned them. Um, and this is like the highest number, uh, highest level of abstraction, which means that I group together several sub-categorizations -categ sub um, here. And this uh, synthesis results in an extremely high number, 91 um, petitions, in which both the external and the self-inscription is in you, which at first, um, at first glance, it might seem paradoxical that you have a change within one category, but if you remember the set of categorizations, there were several subcategorizations of being in you, which entailed different obligations um, and different um, privileges. And uh, these were also very much tied to the control of um, indigenous labor. 
only the categorization of being um, an indigenous noble and not even all indigenous nobles implied that you were um, exempted from all burdens, um, work and um, payment. And um, they were only supposed only to be applied to caciques and their firstborn sons. There was some uh, variation uh, over time uh, also. Um, in practice, and especially in the first half of the colonial period, these wider privileges could also be obtained by other nobles, such as the members of the Ayu Inca in Cajamarca, which I will present in one of the examples. And the other number that stands out is um, the change between the categorization Indio and Mestizo. Mestizos are the children of Spanish and um, indigenous uh, parents. Um, and if we, if we add here the petitions in which it is not entirely clear which, whether the external inscription is Mestizo or Cholo, we have 27 cases. Um, the self-inscription in all cases here was a Mestizo, um, while the opponents or authorities try to get the petitioners categorized as some kind of uh, indio. And it is understandable that the uh, petitioners try to escape the burdens of being categorized as indigenous, since mestizos were exempt both from tribute payment um, and from um, labor service. In this, um, in this, not in other matters, but in this matter, they were fiscally equivalent uh, to Spaniards. And this, as uh, fiscally speaking, it was an attractive um, categori uh, categorization. What is also um, interesting that um, some of these fiscal petitions show a proximity to the um, Provanza de Limpieza de Sangre, uh, which are these proofs of uh, purity of blood. Because if one proved uh, that uh, one was um, pure, pure of blood um, and, and a noble or uh, indigenous noble or Spaniard, one was also uh, exempted from tribute. So there, there were some connections between the purity of blood and uh, the fiscal um, status. Um, the self-inscription as mulatto, uh, this, uh, an Afro-descendant, Afro um, is relatively low in both regions, uh, but it was more salient in New Spain than in um, Peru. And um, now I will um, show you some examples for these petitions, mostly focusing on the subcategorizations of being um, indigenous. The first case is from Cajamarca and dates from 1665. It is from an individual called Francisco Gomez, um, who tried to get raised from the tr tribute list of the Ayu Cañari, arguing that he is an Inca. In Cajamarca, the Inca um, were um, considered a pre-Hispanically foreign group. The, um, <laughs> if you would to call, uh, if you want to call them like that, the the conquerors and colonizers, um, which came from from other parts, and as, as such, they were considered as nobles and were exempted um, from uh, tribute payment and from the forced labor of the Mita, and they were organized in a separate in, in a separate Ayu. We don't know if this was also the case in pre-Spanish times, but in the colonial period, we have um, a long continuity of this, uh, this Ayu Inca. The um, Ayu Cañari uh, was part of the Vaida Guaranga Mitma. Mitma is also um, uh, originally pre-Spanish uh, categorization. Um, which were um, relocated in uh, pre-Hispanic uh, times. And in this case, the governor of the Guaranga Mitma argued that Francisco was part of the Ayu Cañari because his mother, Clara Sisa, was a member of this Ayu, and since her son was illegitimate, he should follow the fuero, the categorization um, of his mother. Um, in contrast to this, the cacique, the lord of the Ayu Inca, defended Francisco's claim. Um, Francisco presented three witnesses from three different Ayus, including the Ayu Forastero. They all stated that Francisco's mother, Clara Sisa, was the legitimate daughter of Juan Aguamanticla mm -hmm. from the Ayu Cañari and Cristobal Diaz from the Ayu Inca. Although Francisco's father, Pedro Gomez, um, was part of the Ayu Inca, and therefore Francisco should follow the fuero, uh, the categorization of his father and gra grandfather. So sometimes um, the... Um, Legitimate, if there was not, not a legit, leg, legitimate descent in uh, one's own generation, you could allege to the leg, legitimate descent in the former generation, which logically does not make much sense, much sense but often it worked. And uh, Francisco, in fact, was successful with his claim 
and uh, was recognized as a member of the IO Inca, um, as uh, which he did not have to pay tribute um, anymore. And um, it is interesting to see that uh, more than a century after the Spanish conquest, pre-Spanish social units um, still existed. And there were several ones, especially for migrants and their uh, descendants. These are the ones uh, marked in red here. And um, social units of descendants of pre-Hispanic migrants, um, like the Inca and the Mitimais, which migrated for very different reasons, coexisted with colonial migrants like the Forasteros. Forastero is a Spanish colonial um, categorization um, for mi migrants and their descendants. I would like to uh, present another case in which the Ayu Forastero um, also played a role, uh, a role. The Ayu Forastero existed in Cajamarca at least since 1636, much earlier than the one white man described for Cusco for the 1720s, which is a very widely cited uh, book. But this is why I quote it. She aptly calls it a kinship of strangers. Um, as I explained before, the Ayo was a unit of corporate common descent, um, which means that theoretically all members have the same ancestry. Um, however, an Ayo Forastero is a paradox in itself because it co was constituted of migrants coming from different places, which of course did not have the same uh, ancestry. Um, but still, it was constituted in an Ayo, and once you formed part of the Ayo Forastero, your um, belonging to it became hereditary. Mm -hmm. So it adapted like to the, um, the social structure um, on the spot and uh, was, was a fle flexible um, response to the changes um, of migration. But these Ayo Forastero they did not um, emerge all over the Viceroyalty of Peru. Um, in, in Charcas, for example, we have not found, um, well, I'm, I'm not working on Charcas, but <laughs> other colleagues um, have not found um, examples of the IOM um, Forastero. Um, here the petitioner is Juan Luna. Um, both his parents were members in the IO Forastero. Uh, and in this case, the, the Lord of the Ayo Malcaden, an Ayo of indigenous people categorized as sedentary, claimed that Luna had voluntarily joined the Ayo Malcaden a few years ago. Luna also appears in the tribute list of this Ayo. Now, as he um, is being enrolled for the forced labor service of the Mita, he wants to leave this Ayo. But Luna himself denies this and is backed up by the governor of the Ayo Forastero. As further proofs, Luna presents his baptismal record and a tribute is re received. And also Luna was successful with his claim. He was being erased from the tribute list of the Ayu Malcaden and recognized as um, Forastero. And this case shows how belonging to a certain categorization was used to evade labor service and obtain fiscal privileges and also shows that um, it seems that one could simply uh, decide um, sometimes uh, to change uh, to another um, social unit, um, even if, but this also could cause a conflict, of course. Um, and that rules of inheritance and belonging which existed were not always um, entirely uh, respected. Um, and it also shows how these um, pre-Hispanic um, IUs, these um, social units of corporate uh, um, common descent, were flexible and were adapted um, under Spanish rule. As I mentioned before, the petitions um, not only came from the um, tribute payers themselves, but also from local and municipal governments. In other words, changes in categorizations were not only initiated by the tribute payers themselves, um, because the other levels also had a great, um, the, the levels, different levels of colonial administration had a great deal of influence in determining them. In a case from 1637 from the city government of Valladolid in Michoacán in New Spain, asked to be allowed to register servants of Spaniards and so-called vagabonds as normal, sedentary indigenous people um, and to oblige them to pay tribute. Mm -hmm. This was justified by the death of an unusually large number of indigenous tribute payers, which was confirmed by various witnesses. And indeed, the petition was partially successful because all vagabonds who did not pay tributes uh, anywhere were allowed to be obliged to pay tribute. So it could also be like a political decision to regroup um, and recategorize people because it served, served the needs of the Spanish colonial administration or because someone was needed um, as labor force or as tribute uh, payers. The last example is from the Philippines, where religion um, played a more, much uh, wider role 
um, in this context than in Spanish America due to the fact that the uh, conversion was incomplete. Of course, I have to say that I'm working on like, very central parts of the Spanish administration and there, there existed, of course, all, also other peripheries in Spanish America where this conversion was a much longer process, but in the areas I studied it, it, it happened at least on the outside uh, relatively um, quickly. Um, of course, it f took a first a few decades, but we don't have petitions from this time. This is just to uh, set it a little bit um, into a uh, context. And it furthermore, uh, furthermore shows how the Chinese migration differentiated the Philippines from Spanish America. This petition was written by a, Phil uh, by a Dominican friar on behalf of the Christianized Chinese merchants of Manila, the so-called Sangleyes. They resided out by, outside the walled city in the, uh, of Manila in the Parian, um, where they were separated. And um, these, uh, um, these Sangleyes complained um, through um, the Dominican friar that when converting to Catholicism, they were being shaved and had to pay an excessive amount of tribute. However, by law, all recently converted indigenous people in the Spanish Empire had the right of tribute exemption for 10 years. Um, besides, the crown had forbidden uh, the shaving of these Sancleyes because it made it impossible for them um, for social and status reasons to go back to China. And since many of them were merchants, uh, they needed to go back uh, once uh, in a while. And um, this petition achieved in confirmation of their rights, um, equaling them with other recently converted um, pagans in other parts of the uh, Spanish Empire. And this example also so shows that fiscal categorizations had a signif significant impact on the daily life of empire subject and therefore were often contested. And contrary to the central, more central areas of uh, Spanish colonial rules in this time, religion was an important um, dividing line in the Philippines, which was due to the entanglement with yet another empire, China. I'm basically through with uh, like the um, petition part. I have like one further slide within which I could speak about uh, the change from personal to territorial association. Uh, which would take a few minutes more, so you can, t I can easily skip it, or do it as you as you wish. Yeah, I go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, I, this is um, another finding um, which uh, came about from a collaboration with my Argentinian colleague uh, Raquel Gil Montero, um, who studies uh, Charcas, which is uh, nowadays. Um, Bolivia, and um, I want to show you how throughout the colonial um, period there was a, a transition from the organization from a personal association, Personenverband, um, to the territorial association, um, the Territorialverband, which was first applied as a concept to Mesoamerica by Höxtra and uh, O'Neill already in the 90s. Um, personal pr um, associations privileged the bonds between people and their leaders, um, and in the case of the pre-Hispanic as well as um, the uh, uh, in Spanish America, these leaders uh, were mostly the caciques, the um, the lords, um, regar um, regardless of their actual place of residence. Um, so you could live somewhere else, but you still had the link to your um, cacique, and you belonged um, to him. This was um, especially clear um, in the Inca Empire with uh, all these uh, resettlements, and. Um, on the other hand, the territorial association, um, the place of residence matters, uh, where um, where you live, and it's uh, the prime criterion for it identifying a person's belonging and classification. And in America, we argue we can see a slow and meandering shift um, in, the, in Spanish America from a pre-Hispanic pre form of personal association towards a late colonial and republic republican territorial association. After the Spanish conquest, tribute collection through indigenous caciques was continued for quite some time, leading to a situation where often only a part of the collected payments or goods was handed over to the Spaniards. This is relevant since the cacicas <laughs> is one of the strongest aspects of the personal association. In both Cajamarca and Michoacán, caciques continued to be significant authorities. They were the recipients of both tribute payment and uh, la personal labor service, meaning that besides the percentage, the, uh, the caciques were legally entitled to keep as a kind of salary. 
The change in, uh, in this organization is most easily observable if we trace um, the, evol uh, the evolution of the categorizations for Astero, Yanacona del Rey, and um, Quintero, which were more or less uh, similar. Um, and uh, all these categorizations denoted in indigenous people living outside their original communities, aus outside their original um, units of corporate um, organization. Um, and generally, and this was also a common denominator without access to communal lands. And this is important because the idea was if you don't have land, you can't pay tribute or you only can pay less uh, tribute. Um, therefore, they often, ha often have been, has, have been characterized as migrants. But it really, the importance is not really the migration itself because these categorizations were also hereditary. So it's enough if your grandfather uh, migrated, you can still be a, a forastero, for example. Um, and um, they were distinguished from the Indios Originarios, which were the indigenous people which were supposed to live in their original communities. Um, they were mobile, of course, but they were categorized um, there too. So it's not really a clear divide between mi migrants and non-migrants, mm -hmm. but just like to have boxes in your head. For the forasteros, we identified um, two alternative forms. Either they continued paying the tribute to their original cacique, being only theoretically obliged to the labor draft of the Mita, and, sus and then thus sometimes not being recorded as such, or they paid a reduced tribute and were legally exempt from Mita obligations. Mm -hmm. In some regions, the second form became, organ be became organized in the um, Ayus Forasteros during the 17th uh, century. While the first form was more common in the Audiencia de Charcas, nowadays Bolivia, the latter form of Forasteros prevailed in the northern part of the Audiencia de Lima. The second categorization, Yanaconas del Rey, were indigenous people that did not recognize their original caciques and did not have Spanish masters. Since early colonial times, they were exempted from meter obligations and their tribute was paid directly to the royal Ixeca. In some places and periods, Forasteros and Yanaconas del Rey were synonymous, and the Quintero was a, 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 a fiscal clad categorization that only existed in Cajamarca. It, it was not found anywhere else in the um, Peruvian rice royalty. And um, the payment of tribute with the original cacique, and therefore the personal association was the primary mode until the general visitation, the general inspection by the vice Roma Mancera in 1645. Um, his ins inspection included for the first time separate lists for Yanacona del Rey and Forasteros within these tribute lists. And from then on, they were present in most of the um, general inspections and lists. Um, but uh, these, uh, this uh, visitation does not, does not survive for all of the vice royalty um, of Peru. It was only um, the, during the 18th century that most of the Forasteros really started to pay the tribute um, in their places of, revel, uh, of uh, residence, therefore more clearly um, establishing the, the system of uh, territorial association. Um, and the regulations regarding Forasteros decreed by the Viceroy Castel Fuerte in the 1730s were an important step um, because it differentiated between forasteros and originarios with and without land. Um, so it further complicated the set of common categorizations, but it made more clearer that really what mattered was if one had land or not. Um, and um, access to land became central or very important depending on the province because um, those tributaries with land were then asked to contribute to the meter. Around 1770, the different amount uh, each categorization had to pay was clearly identified in all censuses. Mm -hmm. And with the establishment of the territorial association, the possession of land become more important than migration for the, de for, um, for the definition of the fiscal categorizations um, discussed above. Mm -hmm. And um, to come to an end, some very brief thought about the three, three uh, structural elements you proposed for the um, self-propelled uh, dynamics. Um, yes, the estate-based uh, hierarchical order of societies with group orientation is definitely present. I think it's very clear um, in my example. Um, culture of culture of presence is, of course, partially important on the spot. Um, the, we have uh, the inspections, the visitas, which are also um, like rituals and, and they were important, um, 
But the colonial administration had different levels and they were in different places. We have first uh, the um, the town of, of the province, then we have the capital of the Viceroyalty, which can be very far away, and then we have the crown on the other side of the sea, and the communication often lasted months or years. Um, so I think uh, this is an important uh, element um, for a, a culture uh, of present, and you can't say it's entirely applicable um, here. Um, then I struggle most with the consensus orientation. And there is um, this famous um, saying, um, which in Spanish is um, se obedece eh, pero no se cumple, o se acata pero no se cumple, which means you obey, but you do not do it, um, <laughs> which is like a paradox in itself, which shows you are um, adhering and you believe in the le legitimacy of the rulings you receive, but you don't do them in practice. Mm -hmm. um, and also we we see sorry we we already discussed it of course that the um that there's a lot of conflict but also that the petitions questions question decisions uh, by the administrators and uh, administrators and they also question the um how the administrators um do uh, the things and organize it and with this i now um really come to an end and thank you for your attention.